Happy St. Patrick's Day to those of you watching us live. Welcome to Duke Reads. I'm Frank Stacio. I'm host of NPR's State of Things, heard on North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. Tonight, Michael Malone, professor of the Practice of Theater Studies at Duke, is here to discuss The Maltese Falcon by Dashiell Hammett. Michael Malone is the author of 11 internationally acclaimed novels, the latest being The Four Corners of the Sky, a national bestseller. He's currently at work on Dark Winter, the fourth of his Hilston Quartet. He's also written plays, television programs for ABC, NBC, and Fox, a collection of short stories, two books of nonfiction, one on film, the other on Jung Jungian typology. Many essays and literary reviews have appeared in Harper's, New York Times, The Washington Post, Playboy, Partisan Review, Yale Review, and The Wilson Quarterly. Among his prizes are the O. Henry, the Edgar, the Writers Guild Award, and an Emmy for ABC's One Life to Live, where he was head writer for over a decade. He's taught at Yale, the University of Pennsylvania, and Swarthmore, lives in Hillsborough, North Carolina, with his wife, Maureen Quilligan, who is the R. Florence Brinkley Professor of English here at Duke. Michael Malone writes that he chose the Maltese Falcon for Duke Reads because it is a classic and quintessentially American fiction, with a title that everyone recognizes and a story that everyone loves. Michael Malone, what a pleasure to oh, talk with you again. Oh, it's Happy St. Patrick's Day to same, you. Same to you. And so tell us more. Uh, uh, give us a, a deeper insight into your choice of this of this classic. Well, I I picked the Maltese Falcon because I, I love it. But uh, I came to it through the movie, and I think a lot of people do. And uh, when I thought about uh, how I would respond to Duke Reads, uh, what came back to me was that there was a time before DVDs and cable channels, uh, and you had to go to the movie theater to a, a retrospective house to see an old film and a film noir. And so when I was uh, uh, in graduate school, I would go to these two theaters, the Brattle Street Theater and the Orson Welles Theater in Cambridge, and it was there that I met uh, Dashiell Hammett through the movie The Maltese Falcon. And then I came to the book after that. Um, of all my beloved American mysteries, the Maltese Falcon is my favorite, and the hero, Sam Spade, is my favorite detective. It was the style of the thing, and I, I read it like Nick Charles uh, <laughs> drank martinis, and if you've read The Thin Man, you know that he drank martinis. It's, in fact, it's astonishing they made me sense <laughs> Nora and Nick Charles because they stand there drinking double martinis hour after hour after hour. Uh, it was the setting and the words and the taciturn prose, the tough yeah. poise and the neon melancholy of it. Uh, it was a way to feel, smoke, dress. It was very dapper and it was gritty, and there was a kind of wonderfully romantic lonesomeness mm. to it. Uh, and it felt like uh, Fred Astaire uh, dancing to me. Um, and s I think it is quintessentially American uh, as a novel. It's a quest story. The mm. black bird itself is like the white whale or the green light at the end of Daisy's uh, dock for The Great Gatsby, it's one of the most well-known mm. emblems in our literature. It's, it's a holy grail. <laughs> uh, and the plot is brilliant. It has an astonishing finish. Uh, and it's a classic that's very, very contemporary. It, you know, you, you talked about it being quintessentially American, and I think there may be uniquely American in a lot of ways, and maybe it, I'll ask you more about that, because the quest tale, of course, is that, if anything is universal in storytelling, it's that. That's the universal mm -hmm. part. And then you mentioned the lonesome hero, mm -hmm. in, in a sense, the anti-hero. There's a lot of things about him that are not virtuous. Is this the first time this character, this particular hero, uh, has appeared in American literature? I don't think it's the first first time, and Edgar Allan Poe would be upset to, <laughs> to think that he hadn't invented the American detective, but it is the moment of when we left behind that British country house and the detective in a white tie and tails, 
And we went uh, into an urban world. We went into a world of uh, eating in grills and eating pig's knuckles, pig's as, yeah. <laughs> as, as, as <laughs> Sam Spade does. Uh, people who work for a living, uh, who are maybe on the shady side of the mm -hmm. law, uh, and who talk tough and act tough, and they sleep together when they don't know each other very well, and uh, they work for a living. Money is very real mm -hmm. in, in this book. I, I brought a, 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 a sample of the original cover. Uh, the book do, reads, uh, has that sort of romantic mm -hmm. lonesomeness and the allure of Sam Spade and Bridget O'Shaughnessy, speaking of the Irish, uh, <laughs> uh, for St. Patrick's Day. But the original Maltese Falcon is about money. It's about money. <laughs> it's about that quest yeah. for the black bird and what that represents. It's really a novel about greed and what people are greedy for. And they're greedy for lots of things, not always only money. Um, it could be some vision of uh, what life could mm. possibly be. It could be romance. But often it is whatever money represents yeah. to them. And I, I think that's part of the power. And that really brings us to the first question, which is how does the novel speak to the time it was first published, 1929? Yes, it first was published in a pulp magazine, Black Mask, and, and then was 1929. And then when it was republished uh, by Knopf, because Blanche Knopf loved mysteries, um, and so it came out as a novel, it's 1930 already, and a lot has happened and to people's money in the interim. And I think the fact that the book is about people who really have to scramble to, to stay alive for a dollar, uh, for a job, for a case, for a meal, um, is very much a part of the amazing success that the book enjoyed from the beginning. Uh, it was very, very successful. And it's a period where, where America's losing its innocence. Some of the sheen of this mm -hmm. sort of glamorous uh, experiment of ours is mm -hmm. beginning to wear off. And so we can begin to see now uh, a less than wholly virtuous hero emerge as the... And he <laughs> is. Sam Spade um, is... We always think of Sam Spade as Bogart. He, he is not. And if you look at the opening paragraph of the novel, uh, he is described as a blonde Satan, mm. and he is a very morally uh, ambiguous character. Mm. Uh, he is a man who, by the end of the book, is going to say, I'm sending you over to the woman he ostensibly loves because you killed my partner, and there's a code of honor, and I have to uh, have you punished for that. When he himself has been having a long time affair with his partner's wife, and so much so that the wife thinks that he murdered the partner <laughs> in order to marry her. So uh, his own code of ethics is a little uh, uh, shaky. Well, and you know, the, the, I had never read the book before, and of course I'd seen the movie, and it was a long time ago. And so to that point, I began to wonder, did he, I mean, it was so plausible throughout the entire mm -hmm. book, that he may have, and of course, Hammett could have ended it that way if he wanted to. Um, I thought, well, you know, that's quite possible he did by the middle of that Well, book. you you can think that. You can also think that Iva, the part Miles Archer, his partner's uh, wife, murdered You're right. him. There's a lot of plausible clues, um, and that's what I mean by it's a really good mystery story, mm -hmm. and people forget that because the characters have overgone the plot, as characters always do. And and yet, there are many possible crimes going on, murders. In the end, I suppose, who cares who killed Thursby? Uh, just like who cared <laughs> who killed uh, Roger Ackroyd, or who, who cared who killed Roger Rabbit, really. Right, right. No, no, nobody cares right. in the end, uh, because it's the characters that, that are unforgettable. 
yeah. But it is a very good mystery story. It's a great story. It's a great story. And so let's let's go to the second question. Of course, we invite your questions, mm -hmm. as always, as we continue our conversation today with Michael Malone about the book uh, The Maltese Falcon by Dashiell Hammett. Second question on our list, and of course, we entertain yours at any time, but um, our second question is why did it immediately attract and then sustain for 80 years this reputation as the great American mystery um, and the great American novel. Well, let's separate those two for a minute and, and, and ask if, it, if, if there's a, a need to separate the great American mystery from the great American novel. Is it as great a novel as it, and, it, and assuming that there's some kind of structural and deeper kind of literary value that a novel requires to be great than a, than a good mystery? This is a question that you know from other conversations, Frank, that, that I care ver about very much. Um, the question of genre and whether you put uh, a novel into a genre or you don't. Um, and I have had the experience in my own career as a novelist seeing some books of mine in the mystery shelf of yeah. a bookstore <laughs> yeah. and other books in the literature uh, shelf. Um, and in a way, it's about how do you define the book as a, as a literary work? Is To Kill a Mockingbird a mystery or is it a novel? Is Huckleberry Finn a mystery or is it a novel? Almost all of Dickens' novels, almost every single one, has a murder in it, a mystery to be solved. Uh, and the last book he writes is The Mystery of... Uh, Edwin Drood. Is that a mystery or a novel? So that can be said of in, any genre. Is Gulliver travel, science fiction? Is Jane Austen uh, romance, Cinderella stories? The, the Maltese Falcon is the only Sam Spade book, so it doesn't uh, raise the question of series, which sometimes is given to me as an answer for why we call this a genre. Well, mm. they're all... There's, there are a great many, uh, Lou Archer, or, or, mm -hmm. uh, Philip Marlowe, Raymond Chandler's books, right. but um, I think there's some ways in which the Maltese Falcon really belongs with other novels that were being written in the 1920s that are perfectly structured, just exquisite, thin works of art. Mm -hmm. They are like Edith Wharton's The Age of Innocence, like Virginia Woolf's, I, I know Reynolds Price was here talking about To the Lighthouse, but, yeah. or her Mrs. Dalloway. Um, Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby uh, is another example. Willa Cather's Lost Lady. They're very small books, and they're beautifully mm. paired. This, this novel, with its t 20 short chapters, moving very quickly, opening scene, that woman comes in, wonderly, the wonder <laughs> of it all. So powerful is that that there really hasn't been an American mystery writer who hasn't been deeply affected by that. That, where's the dangerous woman walking in, she's wearing high heel shoes and maybe an anklet, and and the detective is going to be tricked, or is he not going to be tricked by her? So it had a it had a huge effect on a genre. It is not, I think, as perfect a book as The Great Gatsby. Um, it has incredibly uh, vivid uh, characters. It has beautifully uh, written vernacular dialogue. Mm -hmm. But some, there's some parts, I know it's heresy to say this, there's some um, parts of the book that I don't think would hold up against the absolute best of, uh, of American fiction. Asking different questions about it. As a novel that tells its story with characters you don't forget, and a story you don't forget, right. there's, there's none better. So, so the craftsmanship is what maybe allowed this book to hold up for 80 years 80 now. years, that's almost a century. Yeah. And I do, I do think it has to be honestly said that the power of one of the many movies, the Maltese Falcon had many screen adaptations, yeah. but the best known, of course, is John Huston's um, 
1941 version with Humphrey Bogart. Yeah, I mean, that's unfree. Well, I, uh, Bogart was in my ear the whole mm -hmm. time. You just can't shake that. Um, and, you know, we talked about the, the business of it being a novel and a, certainly a great mystery. Some of the language, I, I think, it, the, in my opinion, some of the mm -hmm. some of the descriptions were weak, but it didn't it didn't kill the book because the, mm -hmm. the the plot moved along so quick. It is cinematic, and it yeah, it had to be made into a movie mm -hmm. and several times because of the. I mean, he, Hammett seemed to be a guy who understood the movies before the industry really understood itself. It's it's and he worked in the movie business and he lived in Hollywood and um, it, as is well known, he lived for many years. Uh, with Lillian Hellman, who also worked in the movie business, mm -hmm. and um, that was very much a part of his own skill and his his own training. But so effective is it as dialogue that it's it's known that that John Huston, uh, who was fairly young at the time he did it, had the uh, assistant simply cut the pages out of the novel and glue them into a movie <laughs> script and then shot the script. He made one really big change, which was to move up earlier the arrival of the uh, bird wrapped mm. in the uh, newspaper that the ship's captain, who's actually played by John Huston's father, Walter Huston, staggers in and drops dead in the office. And he, he moved that up sooner than it actually takes place in the novel. But other than that, it was pretty faithful to the, to the book. Though, interestingly, mm. the f last line, which may be the most famous line uh, that people remember, uh, Bogart's last line, uh, the stuff that dreams are made of when he's asked, what is this bird? And he answers uh, a play on the uh, Tempest, uh, 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 Shakespeare's line. But that was a suggestion that Bogart himself had made. Mm. Uh, can I say, do you mind if I say the stuff yeah. that dreams are made of? And Houston said, sure, say it. So, And that's what people remember. The novel actually ends with uh, Next Week at Work, and Sam Spade says, uh, did you, here's what happened. And she really, Bridget Shaughnessy, O'Shaughnessy killed uh, Archer. And his secretary, Effie, says, stay away from me. She's so upset yeah. because she's made so deep a mistake, which is really puzzling because she's such a, she, she stands for goodness in mm. the book, and yet she's absolutely wrong about this femme fatale. Yeah, well, I, I do think that's one of the subplots in this in this entire book is that uh, you can't that your our own perceptions mm -hmm. are deceiving us. And, and kind of in 1929, 1930, you can imagine that this is where people begin to doubt Everything. the ground on which they walk, and so even the most virtuous. But you know, I want to press you now because I think you've you've landed on perhaps the key difference between literature, if we can do it, and a very well crafted mm -hmm. mystery. When Bogart makes a reference to Shakespeare and then illuminates a subplot that you may not have paid much attention to, the question of greed. The, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, greed is obviously a part of this, but what other dreams are playing in this, the, mm -hmm. the dreams of romance, and where and trust, and what is mm -hmm. true love. All those things are pretty lightly mm -hmm. dealt with in this book. Now, you can imagine a little different language, a few more of those clever mm -hmm. lines along the way, and suddenly we have some depth in this that would definitely qualify it as a literary work. Well, suddenly you have the great gas face. Yeah. You, 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 <laughs> yeah, you yeah. have, and there's a big difference in the black bird and the green light mm -hmm. and how those two are developed and, and explored. And yes, I do think that the question of can you believe, can you have faith, can you trust, Spade wants to. How cynical is he? Yeah, is he yeah. so deeply, completely cynical that uh, you're a son of a gun, Sammy, his lawyer says. Um, he's, uh, he doesn't trust any, you would never uh, cash a stranger's check. He doesn't, he says, I don't trust anybody. I don't believe anybody. Mm -hmm. I, I expect the worst from people, and yet he does seem to mm -hmm. f fall in love, even though he constantly Come. pulls back when he thinks that uh, Bridget has taken the money 
um, from the fat man from Gutman, right. he he makes her in the novel, certainly didn't happen in the movie, strip naked right. to prove to himself that she didn't take the money, which she didn't do. It's one yeah. of the few bad things she didn't do. Right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so that question of is the whole world shifting yeah. out from under us? And there's a curious inset in the book of a story that Sam tells Bridget that's a very, very long story. And it's just about a man who almost got hit on the head by something oh, falling yeah. out of a window. And he was so struck by it that he thought, I hate my life. And he just disappeared, left his wife and his family and his job, and he went off to another place. And years later, he had recreated the exact same boring life for himself. And so the question of, of what do we dare to dream, if mm -hmm. anything, is really, I think, as you say, it's uh, are we in the money and all we care about is money, or is there some dream that... Right. But somewhat underdeveloped. I mean, he starts, you can see he had the germ of the idea, and you think, mm -hmm. whatever happened to that idea? Right. So, so that's... Uh, and there's a way that um, his novel that people also love him was a whole series of, of, of films, uh, The Thin Man, where, as I say, uh, th th this, is, this is crime and punishment. Another, <laughs> by the way, murder mystery. You know the murder uh, mystery. Uh, uh, Although we do know who did it. <laughs> it's kind of uh, Columbo. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that compared to uh, the, uh, the Maltese Falcon, the thin man, it literally all they do is make witty remarks and drink martinis. So. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a question from Melanie. Is Bridget O'Shaughnessy a believable villain? She's a schemer. She's a murderer. But the reader always sees her as clingy and nervous, a demeanor she continues to display even when Sam confronts her with her crimes. It, this, you got to this a little bit, but I think we can develop it further. Effie can't believe Bridget did what she did. How can we? I think that you believe her in a way more in the novel than you do in the movie. And in part because you're imagining and she's being described to you as extraordinarily, A, beautiful, right. and B, innocent looking, mm -hmm. and that you can create that person that you would believe. And there's no reason not to think that she isn't in trouble and she isn't endangered and she isn't um, desperately uh, trying to get somebody to, to help her. I think that she cold bloodedly murdered uh, uh, Thursby, whom we don't know, and so we don't really have much of an investment in him, um, isn't necessarily the case. And in part, we know it so well that we don't trust her from the beginning because yeah. we already know we, we shouldn't yeah. trust her. Yeah, although I, I might be with Melanie on this, and, it, and I think it's the murder of Thursby that does it for me. I mean, what Hammett is setting up for us is someone who we're not quite sure. sure. She is scared, and so a lot mm -hmm. of the, the, the shifty behavior could be simply out mm -hmm. of fear, and that all makes sense. Uh, oh, no, but she's scheming. She's very mm -hmm. smart. Or we, get, mm -hmm. we get some of that. Well, she might be up mm -hmm. to something. The murder is just too crafty and too cold-blooded for what mm -hmm. we know human beings are. I mean, if you're not trained to kill, you really can't sit there and say, if I kill him now, it'll look like he did. No, 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 no. It's a little force, though it's absolutely believable that as he figures out that she was the kind of person Archer would let get close enough right. uh, to him to, to kill him. The murders and the solutions of murders are never as satisfying as the creation of, this, of them and the setup of mm -hmm. the story. The villains almost never pay off for me in, in, in mystery novels with the exception of Hannibal Lecter, who is absolutely yeah. as horrific as you could imagine. Yeah. Um, they, they, they're they not, when the detective sits down in the room and says, you did this and you went through this door and did this, it's always a, a, a bit of a letdown. That, that Scooby-Doo ending. Yes, yeah. ex exactly. <laughs> Which is one reason why the, the, the story is always being spoofed, yeah. uh, because it does set up these archetype 
the woman walks in, is she believable or is she not? Is she trustworthy or is she not? We see it, Chinatown does it. Right. Uh, many years later, uh, in the 70s, uh, uh, and we, we know that uh, pattern. Well, both things happen. It's spoofed because there are these these, these weaknesses in, mm -hmm. in the book, but it's also imitated and honored, mm -hmm. lo these 80 years later, with, with not a, a, a glint of irony. I think that when you do a parody or satire, you, A, you need to know it. Yeah. You need to know the, the form. Um, and you and I were talking before uh, the show about The Chief Detective, which is a case of Neil Simon, he loves it and yeah. he can do it, and he just takes it over the top. Uh, and uh, your affection for, for the form that you're mm -hmm. satirizing uh, comes through. And, and in part with the Maltese Falcon, it is not just Bridget and Sam Spade, it's those secondary characters. And when I was thinking about doing this conversation with you, I asked people, what do you remember about the Maltese Falcon? And I was amazed how many of them said, I remember, and they used the film actors' names, not the characters' names. Hmm. I remember Sidney Greenstreet and Peter Lorre. I remember Joel Cairo uh, and, and Gutman, the two yeah. characters whose passion for that visionary quest, that, that white whale, that black bird. Gutman has been after that bird for 17 years. And when he chisels it away at the end, and it's nothing but plastic, yeah. he says, that's okay. I'll go yeah. look again. <laughs> it really was not about the money, I mean, in, in that sense. No, uh, they were it was to. about the amount. And, and that's a big change from the novel that I just thought of. In the novel, Gutman is killed at the end, mm. when he tries right. to leave, and, and Cairo is, goes to jail. In the movie, they, they're off to Istanbul yeah. after the Black Bird again. Let me do it again. We're still taking your questions. We've talked a little bit about whether this should be considered a genre novel. I think we've really kind mm -hmm. of uh, answered that question. So we'll move on to the fourth question. And again, uh, any questions that you have, we'd be happy to take at this time, too. When people talk with affection about the Maltese Falcon, do they refer to the book or the movie, um, I guess we've talked a little mm -hmm. bit about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but what effect did this have? We talked about the spoofs, but the fact is this also created a very sincere genre. I mean, mm -hmm. every American detective since, one way or another, is Sam I, Spade. I think uh, absolutely that the American detective story, and you go from, from uh, uh, Raymond Chandler um, right through uh, James Elroy of uh, uh, West West Coast, set on the West Coast. Yeah. This book is San Francisco, mm -hmm. not Los Angeles, but that world, um, that no so-called noir, that mm -hmm. mist and dark pools of street lamps and uh, shadowy uh, restaurants that when uh, that sort of hopper in painting terms uh, world owes hugely uh, mm -hmm. to Hammett, and Hammett himself, who was a Pinkerton man, right. he was a detective. I think, too, Hammett's own life, not just his uh, Hollywood life, but his, and connected to that life, his own very heroic uh, stance with the House of Un-American right. Activities, in which he, unlike many people, answered questions in relation to himself, refused to answer any questions about anybody else right. and went to prison for it, though he was ill with tuberculosis. Went to prison for it. That honor that um, seemed sort of uh, ambivalent in, yeah. in, in Sam Spade was certainly the case um, for Dashiell Hammett himself. And I think Hammett's own personality bleeds over mm -hmm. into our sense uh, of the fiction. But I do think it's a novel, and there are many novels that, for uh, for which the film has, uh, in s for many people, Gone with the Wind is another example. Yeah. When you when you think of Rhett Butler, you think of Clark Gable. You see uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that that Rhett Butler, 
And in, in this case, I think uh, Bogart has so embodied the character that, that even more than, than whereas uh, Dashiell Hammett has become the thin man, yeah. uh, 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 Bogart has become. Well, if we're talking about the film, JB has a question. What sort of directorial achievements do you find most compelling from the Houston uh, film within the Maltese Falcon, especially considering Citizens Kane, Citizen Kane's release in the same year? Mm -hmm. um, so, so, you know, we'll take that question first. There's a follow-up. I, I think, um, you know, the Maltese Falcon is not as, quote, arty uh, a, a film. It's mm. not as self-consciously using directing and camera work and uh, montage or cutting. Um, uh, it doesn't have the multiple um, uh, use of points of view. Uh, it's a fairly straightforward in its directing and not directed with an enormous budget so that uh, there is a there is a shot of San Francisco of uh, stock footage establishing mm -hmm. shot and then you're in that little office and you pretty much stay there. You go <laughs> out a tiny bit to his uh, uh, little room that he lives in and a little bit, you can tell it's a studio set yeah. where uh, 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 Archer is killed. But it's, um, it is, but it's brilliantly directed uh, by a man that's gonna go on to be one of America's great directors, John Huston. Um, and the efficiency of its Hmm. style of directing that absolutely matches the efficiency of the prose. Well, the follow-up, I think, gets to that point. Are there any particular inclusions or exclusions that Houston makes that change either the structure of the novel uh, or the film? Well, he wouldn't, but... but. Well, I do, I do think that, um, as we said, to move up the uh, drama of yeah. the person coming in and dropping the bird and, and, and um, is, is one example. There's a lot of exposition uh, and telling the story of the Maltese Falcon and the Knights of Malta and all that goes on for a while that is stripped down. Um, and the presence of Bogart shifts we don't believe that we we could ever not like Sam Spade once Bogart mm. is, is playing the part. Though Bogart started out his career playing mm. killers and villains, uh, um, as did Clark Gable for that for that matter. But um, so necessarily things change when they they become when movies. they become films, especially because of the, usually, the actors the actors stamp. Usually. usually the dream is left possible uh, in a way that the novel, that the, the very fact that Gutman lives, mm -hmm. as far as we know, in the movie is, is the difference in often in a novel and a movie. Well, and it does, again, I guess it gets back to this point. There are these sort of undeveloped themes that, you've, that I picked up here. We've talked about a few of them that it would be interesting if Houston had decided to, to really play those mm -hmm. and change the film and say, I now want to I want to look mm -hmm. at this dream question a little bit more. I want to look at this uh, mm -hmm. question of, of loss of faith a little more deeply. But let's talk about Hammett for a minute because you talked about his testimony before the Un-American uh, mm -hmm. Affairs Committee. He <coughs> had very serious political views. He, yes. wr he wrote at least one, in fact, the, his first novel, the one that mm -hmm. preceded this, was deeply and, and overtly political. Mm. Um, are you surprised that there's not more of his politics and political view in these? I mean, it's a perfect vehicle, it seems to me. I think um, there's there's a way in which the detective genre um, itself at this time is often being written by people and, and film, James Cain and, and so forth, the films that are being made uh, from uh, detective novels. They're like leftist, progressive uh, uh, political positions, but take the politics out, but you're showing the world. Mm. Um, in which people have lost their jobs, the system has seemed to fail them, the, uh, the rich seem to be staying rich and everyone else seems to be suffering, um, uh, a world uh, that is heading into a Great Depression in which uh, global 
not just America, but a global uh, depression in which some countries are going to make different decisions about what to do about that uh, politically, uh, becoming fascist, uh, uh, communist, whatever. America is not going to do that. Right, right, yeah. um, and how, how that world is reflected without addressing directly right. politically as as other writers are doing Steinbeck's right. writing the Ga grapes of wrath and the detective world is not people aren't sitting around in John's grill talking about politics but those politics are are in there well he hints it I mean he hints at it I mean he, he kind of plays around the edges it's it's clear at one point that he doesn't have a lot of trust, nor should mm -hmm. we in the criminal justice system. Look, we can frame, there's no mm -hmm. problem framing this, and all he wants is, a, all the DA wants is a conviction. So if I give him you, he really mm -hmm. doesn't care who did it. Now this is pretty revolutionary stuff in 29, I would think. And they'll believe me, he's saying, we gotta produce somebody, and, it's, and yeah. this guy will work, or this guy. I already know they gotta close the books on this case. Now, and the very fact that the American tradition has uh, turn to the private investigator, the private eye, mm. um, as opposed to the police inspector who is so much uh, right. uh, in the tradition of the British mm. detective uh, fiction, though they had their Sherlock Holmes who's very private and always in an antagonistic relationship to the official police. But there's a way in someone has has written about uh, I think W. H. Auden has written about in um, in American fiction, a detective fiction, you have to go find a connection. You don't know how people are connected. Mm. You have to go through the streets and the fog in the midst and figure it out. In the British, everybody is connected and somebody shouldn't be because they are a killer. Mm. And you have to exclude that person. And that's a very different social um, construction. You've written mysteries. Do you uh, at all find yourself channel channeling Dashiell Hammett? Uh, do you draw I, from him? I th I think in my my novels, which are a series, uh, well, if I ever finish the fourth, it'll be, it'll be a quartet. <laughs> well, it it's, could be a trilogy, a, and you're it, done. It's a trilogy. You're now. done. It's not, <laughs> it was going to be just one, and then it became a, a duet, and then a trilogy. So it, there are two uh, police. But detectives in North Carolina, uh, and one is a very romantic, uh, Hammett uh, uh, leaning character, Justin Seville before, and uh, the man who begins as his homicide partner and then goes on to become his boss when he becomes captain, is a very wry and uh, character. Uh, bemused by this whole romanticism of the private eye detective. Mm -hmm. So I can have it both ways. I can enjoy it and and laugh at it at the same time. You've talked eloquently about, about the, the power of storytelling itself and bristle at this notion that there is some, some huge difference between literary and uh, so literary writing mm -hmm. and, and good writing that's popular. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as a guy who won an Emmy for mm -hmm. uh, writing soap operas, you really feel that that's the quintessential American form and done well, and certainly mm -hmm. you credit it as having done it very well. Well, uh, It shouldn't be looked down on, shouldn't be frowned on. I, I think uh, everything about my own work um, and the range of it, including writing soap opera, writing uh, novels, writing um, uh, nonfiction, whatever, um, s speaks to that, um, that, and I've taken a huge amount of grief for ever having said, um, Dickens would have written soap opera. Dickens did write soap mm. opera, um, wrote serial. Uh, mm. And so uh, I think it's very significant the two classes I'm teaching this term at Duke. Uh, one is creating a serial drama, uh, and they're actually writing these incredibly gifted young uh, people at Duke. Uh, they're writing a, a television series um, that is essentially a soap opera. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
that um, is marvelous. And the other course is called America Dreams American Movies. And it's very important to me that it's movies. It's not film. Mm -hmm. It's movies. And those American movies that America dreams, uh, like the stuff that dreams are made right. of um, at the end of the Maltese Falcon, I think not only reflects what the country is, but it helps to create what mm. the country is. And, mm. and so, and a film of this novel that we've been talking about tonight is, is a part of that. Um, it's one of those movies um, that help to create the culture, the popular culture uh, of America. As a critic, what, what are the essential elements of good drama, even if, and, and we'll, we'll sort of eliminate this term literary, but what mm -hmm. are the essential elements? I mean, is it just vox populi, vox dei, if we like it, it must be good? Or are there, are there critical elements that you think well, transcend that? Well, uh, to, to, to go to this course the, on American Dreams, American Movies, the three um, things that we look for are, it was very popular, it's one of the top 100 films in American uh, popular culture, but it stood the test of time, and that it has been acknowledged and explored what makes it a classic. And when you look at a classic, whether a movie or a novel, it opens itself to you. It opens itself in 1929, and it opens itself again in 2010. It tells you different things at different times, but all those things are in there for you to find. We can move on to the fifth question as we continue the conversation about Dashiell Hammett's The Maltese Falcon today with Michael Malone uh, and taking your questions as well. Malone's relation to the book and his acquaintanceship through discussions bring it to the stage uh, with Hammett's granddaughter and, and literary executor who have a passionate uh, a commitment to the book's legacy. So talk about its... Well, I uh, decided that The Maltese Falcon should be a musical. Not just a play, but a musical. <laughs> but then I think everything should be <laughs> a musical. I, I guess if there's any popular form that I love as much as, as serial drama or movies, it's musicals. Um, and so uh, uh, we've been talking about that possibility. And it may seem like antithetical um, to the musical, which is very affirmative and exuberant mm -hmm. and communal. Uh, it's about aspiration and about uh, uh, romance. And, but the Maltese Falcon actually has ex very lyrical characters. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know if this musical will ever happen. I I know the uh, no one could care more, love this book more than these people do, um, both uh, descendants of, of Hammett's and mm -hmm. people whose guardianship of the work is deeply knowledgeable and 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 and, and deeply felt. Um, but they agree that there is in those characters, in their largeness, in their dreams, um, in their um, desires, uh, something that could lend itself to song, um, that, that the astonishment of a gutman or the desire to be able to believe of a Sam Spade or the yearning um, uh, of Effie, his senator. Mm -hmm. There are qualities in the characters that that can could make it a, a I musical. I mean, is this what's the vision? Is it really people in the sort of the classic uh, form in, in the formal sense, people just busting into song in the middle of the scene, or is it? Well, that that uh, that's funny. That 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 for 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 a musical to really work. It can't be that people talk and they have the scene and then they yeah. burst into song yeah. and then they talk some more. The song yeah. is the absolute fulfillment mm -hmm. of, of the scene. So one of the things that works, nobody could figure out how to do Pygmalion 
as a as a musical. Many, many people try, including Rogers and Hammerstein, and said, forget it, can't be done. It's a perfect play, it shouldn't be. Mm. Finally, Lerner and Lowe figured it out. Ooh, wait a minute. We will just let what they feel be sung. So mm. the moment that it's going from abs Shaw's dialogue into the song, uh, why can't the English teach their children how to speak? And then it goes into mm. to to song um, is the way you would do. And in, I guess in a way that's what that's what Shakespeare did. When you suddenly go into go in fr from prose into verse, things mm -hmm. are getting more elevated. He's he's moving mm -hmm. into another sphere. And, and all of a sudden you've got a soliloquy, which is, in a, in a way, what a song is. And I suppose that could amplify, I mean, maybe you just said that, but that, that some of these other themes that we're, mm -hmm. at least I was wanting to see more richly developed could certainly come out in song because of the s sonority of the language already. Yes, and, 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 and would, ha would have to. There's, there, yeah. there are ways in which um, it, would, it would have to open up uh, its own possibilities. There's a, mm. I talked about Pygmalion and My Fair Lady, there's an enormous difference in those two. As close as My Fair Lady is to Pygmalion. The, My Fair Lady ends, she comes back, and you know how he feels about her. Whether they're going to get together or not, you don't know, but it's possible because he's sung, I've grown mm. accustomed to her face. So that's, that's a change. And, um, and so there are all, there, any time you go from one form to another form, the form itself changes right, right. what and you do. So, so is this in, in progress, really, is it, right it now? It is uh, uh, possibly in progress, wow. as, as uh, this is why I, I know um, some people say, I'll never work on anything that's not in the public domain. Or I'll never, mm -hmm. uh, no directors who say, I'll never work with a live author again. I'm, I'm, <laughs> a, I'm only going to direct opera, Mozart operas. Uh, so. right. what, what, now, that would be the problem, it seems to me, and I know you've talked a little bit about this with, in, in soap opera, when you have to make a radical change, a character is going to either, either kill them or a spouse, mm -hmm. The characters themselves become so embedded in this in the in their own character. The mm -hmm. actors do; they begin yelling at you about, <laughs> about well, changes well, you have a, to it's make. A, the slide between the persona of, of an actor, and we've talked a lot about Bogart yeah. tonight. Um, and sometimes when we've been talking, we talk about Sam Spade, and sometimes we yeah. talk about Bogart. In the same way, when you watch Rear Window, you might say Jimmy Stewart, or you right. might say Jeffries. Um, and I, I think um, I, these Duke students doing the television series, I, I was a little taken aback when in their 13th episode, almost everyone in this town of Highland Falls uh, is, dies, I, it, it just it sh kills each other or, or goes mm -hmm. off the road. Or, and I said, my God, this is, uh, awfully dramatic, <laughs> and why did you do this? And they said, "Well, all the actors are seniors, so uh, they'll, 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 they'll be leaving. So we we killed them all." And I said, "Well, no, you 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 all you have to do is say the part of so and so will be now hmm. be played by a sophomore." Uh, but uh, <laughs> there is a there is a way in which the uh, in a serial uh, the actor's identity. Yeah. takes over from the fictional. Identity. Would that be the problem with this this novel? I mean, if it were ever to come to the stage, nobody can share, even today, this the film is, is uh, you know, 70 years old or 60 years old. That is one of the reasons it seemed to me to make a musical yeah. made sense. Because if you made a straight play of it, as soon as Sam Spade opens mm. his mouth, you're going, where's Bogart? If when he opens his mouth he's singing, you don't ask that question because yeah. you've shifted the, the form. You know, we talked about the time, the context in which this was written and the time in American history. And it's interesting to me, and I don't know how many of our viewers would agree or if you do, 
but certainly the, the, the series, The Rockford Files, seems to reprise this in, entirely. I mean, he's mm -hmm. that guy all over again, having trouble with the law, trusts people in the wrong way, gets in trouble mm -hmm. for not knowing how it comes out. And it was done, it was an extremely popular mm -hmm. series in the 1970s, mm -hmm. when once again, the ground had shifted beneath our feet. We mm -hmm. didn't know who to trust, and we didn't know what you know what was going to happen next. I mean, is, is that do you find any parallels there? That that's the perfect time to reprise. I think um, I mentioned Chinatown, which is another example of just what you're talking about in the Rockford Files. That that film noir, that neo noir, comes back because it, in that period. Um, the the disillusionment yeah. you cannot trust the government mm. uh, Watergate it was ha happened uh, the Vietnam uh, it, it mm -hmm. w what did we how did we get here mm -hmm. we've been here Americans seem to have very short memories they don't remember that we've been here before yeah. um, and therefore you go there again but I do think that there is a similarity in those periods, and that's what I mean when I say that a classic will yeah. will come back again and again. I'm I'm always been fascinated that that Gadsby has not had a successful film ad adaptation, though it, it's been on the stage, it's been an opera, it's been many movie versions, but they never seem to work. Um, and is there something in Gatsby and in its narration? This this is this doesn't have a, f a first person narrator, though many detective American detective novels do. Yeah, they yeah. have that eye. I, yeah. I walk these yeah. mean streets. Um, in fact, it's a it's a parody now. Yours uh, truly, yes. Johnny Dollar. Yes. You know? uh, <laughs> um, yeah. uh, so that and the noir world has that male voiceover yeah. narrator. Even a dead man in Sunset Boulevard is floating in the pool, but he's talking to you. Um, and or, or double indemnity, he's dying as he talks to you. But this doesn't, doesn't have that. And, I, and I, I often wonder, though, if Nick's voice in Gadsby is why they can't seem to figure out how to make a movie. Well, or, or, I mean, is it a class problem? I mean, you know, we've got Sam Spade on the streets with the rest of us, and mm -hmm. he doesn't represent that upper echelon that too few of us are, mm -hmm. are, are from. That, well, I that think uh, the, that w the rich are very different from you and me, as, as Fitzgerald said. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, um, that while Nick is a middle-class person and yeah. very consciously talks about that and all, there was a sense for Fitzgerald and uh, at the time uh, that he wrote uh, Gatsby um, and Tenders the Night, when the world had shifted in the way you and I've talked about, where people wanted to read this kind of book, wanted mm -hmm. to read Steinbeck, wanted to read politically focused on the, the problems uh, and didn't want to read about uh, a, a psychiatrist and his uh, troubled wife on the Riviera and Tender right. as the mm -hmm. Night. Mm -hmm. So I do think there is a, a way in which that's true. And uh, this book, will it endure another 80 years? Oh, absolutely. If books endure, and I think they will, yeah. um, I have faith that they will, I think the I I'm this is the first on the uh, national uh, domain of the humanity big read Maltese file the first quote mystery um, and uh, so following the footsteps of the great Gatsby. Yeah. Michael Malone, thank you so very much. What uh, a pleasure. What a pleasure. Good way to spend St. Patrick's Day. It certainly is. Uh, we talked about the Maltese Falcon today on Duke Reads, uh, our penultimate session of this session. I can't believe the year has gone by so fast. Um, this, uh, For those in the audience, this session will be available on Ustream and YouTube and iTunes. Um, we've exhausted only two of the vowels we have uh, in the next day or two. <laughs> Uh, our next session will be April 21st, and Stephen Nowicki is going to be here to talk about Bel Canto by Ann Patchett. Please send your comments and questions in advance, and also let me remind you that this Friday, March 19th,
Ken Dodge will be on office hours at noon Eastern time, and his topic will be investing in children, policies regarding children and, and public resources. So do tune into that, and thank you very much for watching Duke Reads.